Um, I, I want to begin tonight with a lesson that I'm titling, Because People Matter. I got this title in the middle of the night. I was thinking about these last several verses of Ephesians chapter 4. We will actually stretch into the first couple of verses of Ephesians chapter 5. And this is a passage where Paul deals with some moral code stuff. Don't do this. Don't do this. Start doing this. It's a little bit of what we did a few weeks ago with put off, put on. Put off the old man, put on the new. Of course, it's a little bit that. It's the same chapter. It's just Paul changing gears a little bit as you get right here near the end. And it allows me to really dig into a thought. The subtitle is the thought because people matter. But it allows me to really dig into a thought that for me is vital to my own walk. Um, maybe it will be to you as well. Um, we're going to do a little different tonight. All, the only thing I have on the screen tonight are the texts from Ephesians 4 and the first two verses of Ephesians 5. Everything else is just me talking out what has been working in me, um, working out what hopefully he's been working in to stay true to Scripture. Um, and so let's read. Let's read it all the way through. That's Sometimes I try to read it all the way through, then go back and work through. I'm going to try to do that tonight. Read it all the way through. Go back and work through. So don't worry about moments where you go, hmm, that sounds odd. Why'd Paul say it that way? Um, we'll work on it. We'll work on it together in just a moment. I'm reading from the NRSV, so it's going to sound a little different than maybe you've been accustomed to, particularly if you're from the King James or the New King James. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, all the way through chapter 5, verse 2. That's, of course, the first two verses. And the reason I did that is that word right there, therefore, kicks off chapter 5, which I think... If you got a therefore to kick off a chapter, maybe you should put it in there when you read the previous chapter. So then putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, rather let them labor and work and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. And therefore, be imitators of God. Because in light of all of that, imitate God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So a lot to talk about. You can probably catch if you... I try to slow read... As you slow read, you might catch a recurring theme is that at, sort of at the tail end of every one of these, it has to do with the other person in the room. Like, don't lie because you're a member of another person. Um, don't be angry and let the sun go down. That just makes room for the accuser. That just makes room for the, the outside world to get in. Thieves, give up stealing so you can share with people that are in need. Don't talk evil. Because your words are giving grace to other people who hear you. You see it over and over in this passage. It's everything he tells you not to do. What you don't see is, don't do this because you guys are Christians and you're not supposed to live that way. Or you don't see, don't do this lest God get mad at you. Pour out His wrath on you. Don't do this unless you want to burn in hell forever. Don't do, you know, kind of par for the course of the kind of things that maybe we heard that were motivational Motivational. Well, it's, it's motivational, all right. We motivated us in the wrong way. I mean, you can get whipped, get motivated, you just keep getting beat. You know, okay, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm tired of getting hit. I mean, that was a lot of the reasons why uh, that's what I mean by motivation. Negative motivators. Okay, we heard negative motivators. Um, and I'm not trying to paint the whole church with the same brush. Believe me, I know, I know that not everybody's heard the same style of message or the same Jesus or the same grace. But I think for the most part, a lot of us are accustomed to thinking that we shouldn't do this and shouldn't do this and shouldn't do this and shouldn't do this because God's 
expecting more of you and God's going to judge you and God's going to get mad at you and you are maybe go to hell if you do it long enough, even though you accepted Christ. So I can't cover the gamma of how everybody views it. I can only really talk about myself. Um, so let's start at the top and then just work our way through. Start with lying. Put away falsehood. Let us all speak the truth to our neighbors for we're members of one another. Or as my spirit says this, let's all speak the truth to our neighbors because people matter. That's what I heard in my spirit. That's, that's where this title came from. For me, this whole segment was, here's why I want you to do this, because other people matter. Because we're members of one another means other people matter. If, if my wife matters, then what I do as her husband is not done because of a fear of God, but because she matters. If she doesn't matter, or if you don't matter, or if your neighbor doesn't matter, then your actions are different in front of people you don't think matter. Now, we all do this naturally. Okay, because we're like, well, I don't, that person doesn't matter to me. I don't know them. Or we'll say, I don't know them. I don't care what they think. Okay, that's kind of our snap response to people that don't matter. Now, this isn't meant to be condemnatory or judgmental, make us all feel guilty for the things we do around people that don't matter. I'm just using an illustration is that not everybody matters the same way to you. And, and they're not supposed to. I mean, your, your kids are going to matter to you in a way that other people's kids aren't going to matter to you. And that's so that you'll take care of your kids <laughs> and so that you'll put them first. And that's sort of a natural thing. And, and there's nothing unnatural about that. What Paul's trying to get the Ephesian church to do is to realize that they all matter to God. The Jew, the Gentile, the Roman, the barbarian, the stranger, the religious man, the prostitute, they all matter to God because they all matter to Jesus. And Jesus doesn't have degrees of how much they matter, though we do see a Jesus who seems to have degrees as to how hard, how, what kind of effort he goes to, to, to bring people up. And it seems to be the lower they are, the more effort he goes to to bring them up, which tells us not that God loves the, the outcast more than he loves the elevated, but that God's field is level. And that what he's really trying to do is pull up to that level place, uh, all of us. Um, so let me address what, when you read these kind of texts, are really the elephant in the room, that if you don't square this away, becomes a problem for interpretation. And that is what I think of as sort of moral code Christianity. Okay, so moral code Christianity is a, a faith that is built on moral structures. Do this, don't do this. And, and lists of things that we do because we're Christians and things we don't do because we're Christians. And if you don't do the things you should do, you're lesser of a Christian. And if you do the things you're not supposed to do, you might not even be a Christian. Or if you are one, you might not be one for long. That, that, that sort of thing. And what we've done is we've built a Christianity around moral code that really that isn't necessarily built around Jesus. See, Christianity is the religion that coalesces around our faith in Christ. It coalesces as a community of believers around our faith in Christ. Um, this is why you could make the argument that Christianity is a religion because a relationship can't be had with a, with a faith, but it can be had with a person. My faith, my relationship is not with Christianity. My relationship is with Christ. My Christianity is an expression of my relationship with Christ, but it's more than that, it's an expression of my relationship with you. Because there's no such thing as a Christianity, it's just me. That's why, that's why there is no such thing as a church of one. So we're all this body. When Christianity coalesces around its faith in Christ, it has Christ as the center pole. Everything else rotates around that. But unfortunately, and, and I don't, I'm trying to say this without sounding like I got something figured out, because honest to God, I don't have anything figured out. I'm just a guy that I'm, I'm passionately in love with Jesus. I'm tired of watching people get beat up. I think you deserve to hear that God loves you. And if I'm the only person that ever tells you that, at least someone told you that. 
That's kind, of, that's kind of the way I've just settled on ministry. So I don't have anything figured out. I don't know a ton of stuff. I got a lot of Bible. I got a lot of knowledge. I've, I, I've got a lot of stuff that I'm working on, but I know God loves me and I know God loves you. And if I can help you to get that revelation just a little bit, well, then that seems to me to be an eternal victory. So I don't have stuff figured out, but I, I, so I'll say this, I, I'm afraid that rather than a Christianity that rotates around Christ, we've built a Christianity that rotates around morality, doing stuff, not knowing Jesus, but doing stuff. And it's why when we define what we believe, we define what we don't believe. So go, what do you guys believe down there at that church? Well, and we might give a couple of salient Christian points, but then we'll start getting political and we'll start getting legislative and we'll start telling you the stuff we don't agree with. We don't think y'all do that. We don't believe in that. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, we're different because some of these churches, they all let you, and you go on, the, people start going on these rants about all the stuff everybody else lets you get by with, but boy, down here at this, we don't. And we get really puffed up like we got something figured out because we got these moral lists. Just makes me think our Christianity is built around moral code. Okay, this is what I mean by an elephant in the room. God is not a bookkeeper. God is not a cosmic bookkeeper who opens his books up and, and then check. Oh, she did that. Check. Oh, messed that up. Got to write that down. Time, date, and place. So you can remind her of that when she gets over here someday. And you go, well, how do you know God's not a bookkeeper? Well, okay. One of the ways that we know is because when Jesus would be confronted with people's actions that were in the book, this one was caught in adultery in the very act. The book says we ought to kill her. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. How are you allowed to do that? Because he knows the heart of his father. Now, you want a legal way that he could do it? It's because he knows where he's going and he knows why he's here. I'm taking what she did to the cross. And while that... I'm going to get a little metaphysical here on you for a second. She commits that sin here and he doesn't die till here. Here's your timeline. All right. You know, here's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday. Okay. She commits her little adulterous affair right here and he doesn't die till over here. But he knows what's coming because he's got, he's outside of space and time. And neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. How can you do that? Because I'm going to take your adultery into me at the cross and I'm going to die and I'm going to raise again. And if he can do that for her there then he's done that for you before you were born. Makes sense to me. What would that look like? It would look like 2 Corinthians 5. God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself, not counting their transgressions against them. God was in Christ reconciling the world back, not reconciling himself to the world because he doesn't need to reconcile himself to the world because he didn't run off when the world failed. The world ran off. Paul's been trying to establish that for most of Ephesians 4. You were enemies in your mind. You ran away from God by your works. God didn't need to reconcile. God's been there the whole time. But he brought the world back. But he could only do it if he didn't count their stuff against them because their stuff is what makes them feel guilty and keeps them away from a loving father. So if I can take your stuff away, you won't have any reason not to come and let me embrace you, hold you, and love you. And so get out of the bookkeeping God business. So if your Christianity has a bookkeeper God in the center of it, then your church is going to be a place that's a bookkeeping church. It has to be because it's trying to be reflective of the God it serves. So God's keeping score. We're keeping score. So when you hear someone say, I don't preach enough on sin down there, it's because they have a God that only thinks about sin. They have a God that only thinks about what you do. He doesn't think about what he's done to reconcile the world back to himself and not count your sins against him. He just thinks about what you do. And you've also created a place where what you do is of greater import than what Jesus has done on the cross. So, if you have a bookkeeping God, then this stuff is about you staying saved. If you don't have a bookkeeping God, then what's the point in telling people don't lie, don't steal, don't talk trash. Don't grieve the Holy Ghost. Don't let wrath destroy. Why? Who cares? If God's not keeping score, and I don't think he is, because by the way, if he is, you're screwed. I mean, if he's keeping score, we're in trouble because how are you going to keep up? He never sleeps. Like he knows everything. So 
lean on the mercy of God. So always lean on the mercy of God and the grace of God. So you don't have a bookkeeping God, so what's the point in doing all this stuff? So that brings me to the question, what, what, what good is right living? Which leads me back to something I felt the Lord said to me in prayer about a year ago. And I was rehashing the old statement that I used to say all the time in grace, and I think Charles Spurgeon coined it, or at least he's the first person that said it out loud. Right believing leads to right living. And I used to preach that, preach that, preach that hard because I was pastoring a church where people live right. So get up and say, look, I want you to live right. I'm not up here preaching on sin. What I'm going to do is preach on who you are in Christ. And I want you to believe it because if you believed it, you'd live right. And I said that for years. And I prayed that about a year ago and the Lord said to me, what good would that do you? Right believing leads to right living. And the Lord said, what good would right living do you? And I thought, that's a good question. What good would right living do me? I mean, it wouldn't do me any good with God. I mean, if my right believing is in Christ, then my right living is not going to give me brownie points. It's not like God goes, oh, Paul's living right. Here we go. Checks, checks from heaven, favor, blessings, anointing, glory. You know, and we went, and, but that's kind of the way, you know, we kind of feel like, well, if you live right, God be able to bless you. We even kind of sneak that in sometimes. Go, oh, no, we're not saved by works. But if you live right, God will bless you. And, and, and then a lot of times that's if you tithe right, you show up to church, you read your Bible, you're in a, you're in a position for heaven to bless. Position. We're in a position for heaven to bless because heaven couldn't find you if you weren't in the right position. The God that makes his bed in hell, if you're there, can't find you if you're not in the right favor position. I don't buy that. So what good would it do you? And what I... What I felt like the Lord revealed in me was not right right believing leads to right living, but right believing can lead to right relationship. Because if you believed right, you might actually start to see God as your father. You might see yourself as a son or a daughter. And out of that, the right relationship that we have with God might be what Paul said to the Athenians when he said, we are all his offspring. And this is a guy that is looking at a bunch of idol-worshiping Greeks and calling them the offspring of God. you got to have a revelation of the love of God to pull that off. Because we're all God's offspring. He's not very far away from us. In Him we live, we move, we breathe, we have our being. And then he tries to introduce them to resurrected Jesus, and they laugh him out of the room. Half of them do. I mean, he just told them, God's not very far from you. You're His offspring. But He's a new man, and you can be too. And that, that was a bridge too far. The Christian message should not be, we're the children of God, you're not the children of God. The Christian message ought to be, we are God's offspring, all of us, but the resurrected Christ Jesus gives us the right to live the life of God on the earth. We can know that we're sons. If we believed that and then lived that, we'd have a reason to put away lying, stop stealing, stop talking trash, stop grieving the Holy Ghost, and none of them would be about going to heaven. They would be because our neighbor matters. Because these other people are so loved by God that I don't want to do anything that destroys my neighbor. I don't want to set their life back. I don't want to make their life worse. I mean, it all comes down to a real Sunday school statement. Sometimes I think we've left this stuff to the little kids' Sunday school too much. Um, golden rule. You know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And then the very next verse, Jesus goes, For straight as the gate narrows the way, straight as the gate that leads to life, and few there be that find it, broads the way that leads to destruction, many there be that go their own. And I think what Jesus is saying is, do unto others you'd have them to do unto you is a narrow gate. Not very many of you will pull it off. Doing unto others whatever they do to you, that's the wide way. That's the easy way, by the way. How do you navigate the world? Well, I'll just wait and see what everybody does to me. And if everybody's nice to me, it'll be a good day. But I'm not in the mood for it. If you cut me off, today's the day. You're in trouble. You cause me problems, I'm causing you problems. And we actually kind of think that's strength. You know, it's like it's strength to to retaliate fire with fire, not just fire with fire, fire with burning the whole place down. You're like, you know, you, you singe me, I'm going to knock your whole house down. That's going to teach you to stop singeing me. That's the Broadway. What happens on the Broadway? Everyone dies. It's just destruction. It's live by the sword, die by the sword. And the narrow way is, I'm going to treat other people the way I wish the world were oriented. How would I wish it were? I wish it was oriented around, you know you're one of the sons of God. I wish it was oriented around, you knew God loved you. I wish it was oriented around, I know I'm forgiven. So I'm going to treat you as if 
you know you're one of the sons of God, as if you know you're forgiven and as if you know you're loved. And I'm not going to do it because you are all of those things, although you are forgiven and you are loved. I'm not going to do it waiting on you to get it, but because it matters. And so if we could get away from church organized around moral code, uh, maybe we would realize that transformation is God's work in us. Transformation is not our ability to behave or to act right. And so transformation is a slow process because we don't get to tell God how fast to work. And one of the reasons why God is so slow on our clock is because He's so loving. And He's guiding and, and steering and moving. And I think the fire of the Holy Spirit that's baptizing us is baptizing our lives and trying to find those things that need burned out of our lives. Um, you know, the Lord loves you so much that the fire of His love will chase you. I, I think the fire of His love, I think the fire of His love will chase you for eternity. I, of course, can't prove what happens when you draw your last breath. I'm just so enamored of a loving God who went to such great lengths to put himself in our place that it seems impossible to me that he is so cool with losing most of us. But the Christianity a lot of us have been introduced to, he loses most of us. In fact, most, of, most people die and never even encounter him at all. And that's their one shot. And so I'm not here to try to present to you an eschatology beyond the grave, but I do believe very much that what we have confused with the power of God to make me speak in tongues, to make me shout, to give me the authority to pray over the sick, all of that stuff's fine. In fact, sometimes it's exactly what needs to be done. But we've so confused the fire of God with power, power to do, that I think we didn't realize that the, the Holy Spirit's really doing two things in all of us at the same time. Um, this is something that our audience, my audience will probably hear me say three sermons in a row because I feel like I said this this weekend two or three times in messages that haven't aired yet. Um, John the Baptist is baptizing people in the Jordan and he, he says there's one coming after me who's preferred before me, shoe latchets I'm not worthy to unloose. I baptize you guys with water. And for the Jewish mindset, that's just purification. Baptizing with purification. Now John's ratcheted it up. He said, I've given you a baptism under repentance. And so you're coming in there to be ritually bathed. If you're a Jew, ritually bathed is just to cleanse me of all the junk I've touched. You know, it's a filthy world. John goes, I'm baptizing you under repentance. So this is a symbolic baptism. It's not just to clean you off of dirt and dead bodies and blood and whatever, which was the Jewish rites of purification, but this is to do something more. It's to baptize you into a mind change. And, the, and I'm sure the crowd was like, mind change into what? He goes, the mind change that's necessary to receive the one that's coming after me, who's preferred before me, whose shoe latches I'm not worthy to unloose. I baptize you with water. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And... Why Holy Ghost and fire? Um, those are two different things. But we've kind of made them the same thing. And we did that because at Pentecost, the Holy Ghost falls and cloven tongues of fire sets on everybody's head. And so what we sort of did in Pentecost is went, Holy Ghost fire! We just kind of crammed them together as this thing, Holy Ghost fire. Uh, and that's fine, but there's a distinction there. Baptize you with the Holy Ghost, he baptize you with fire. And to a Hebrew mind, there's Moses' story. I know I'm stepping slowly here because I'm just kind of working some of this out, out loud. He's stepping slow. He's, he's, Moses steps carefully up the mountain when he sees a bush burn and is not consumed. And he goes up the mountain and he hears a voice from heaven say, Slip your shoes from off your feet. The ground you stand on is holy. Moses takes his sandals off and he watches this bush burn, but there's no ashes, there's no smoke. It's just fire. It's just fire, which is amazing. Out of that fire, God speaks, transforms Moses into the kind of man to become a redeemer. 
like that. Just transforms it. Go back and tell them the I am sent you. And so for Israel, the, the fire of God or the Holy Spirit of God, part of his role is to illuminate, to make you into who you're supposed to be, to shine the light onto the dark area of your soul, not the sin. That's, Christ has taken care of that. To shine the light on the dark area of your soul so that you can be honest with you, that by being honest with you, you bring the real you into the light. Jesus said, whatever's done in the dark will be exposed to the light. Who's that light? Holy Spirit. I will give you the Holy Spirit. He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. He will tell you things I cannot tell you now. What's that mean? It means when the light gets turned on, bing, that's light bulb, bing, light bulb moment. You go, wow, saw stuff I never knew. And that's illumination. The light illuminates. Everything gets brighter. So bright, your eyes go blind. That's Saul on the road to Damascus. That's the Holy Ghost. What's the fire? The fire. John goes, he should baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with the fire. His fan is in his hand and he purges his floor. Here's Jesus in the great threshing floor with his fan blowing the, the chaff off the threshing floor. The, so that what gathers on the other side is all the, the chaff. The wheat's too heavy. And so the wheat falls to the ground, but he blows the chaff. His fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor. He'll gather the wheat into the barn and he'll burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. So what happens when we come to Christ is the Holy Spirit illuminates who we are and burns off what we're not. And it starts the moment you meet Jesus. And it never ends. I don't even think it has to end when you end. Be why? Because he never ends. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And so as he burns, and the, uh, maybe, the, maybe the great illustration of this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are tied up with their hands and their feet, and they're dragged into a furnace. The Bible says it's seven times hotter than it's ever been before. Good old number. Hebrews catch that. This is the ultimate fire. You could call this Holy Ghost fire. And the men take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the furnace. And according to the book of Daniel, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get into the furnace, they're chill. They're cool. In fact, they're so cool, Nebuchadnezzar's standing above it looking through a window and sees a fourth man in the fire. He goes, how many we throw in? They go, three. He goes, why do I see four? There's a fourth man in the fire walking around looks like the Son of God. What a statement. Looks like the Son of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fire inside the furnace is simply, it's doing two things. It's illuminating who they really are, sons of God, so much so that there's the Son of God walking amongst them. And it burns off their, their cords. But what does it do to the men that threw them in? You ever read that part of the story? The Bible says that the fire was so hot that when the men threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in, they fell over dead because the fire was too hot. You want an example of the wrath of God spurned? It's those men that fall over trying to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. The fire burns up in you what isn't you. And for those that reject that fire, I guess you could say there's, there's a part of you that is still dead and it's sin and it's trespasses outside and needs an encounter with Christ. If you can encounter the Christ that's in the fire, you'll be fine. Um, you can't fake that transformation. That's my hope. You can't fake the, the burning off. Because... Because it's the real you that gets pulled out of the dark. And so all the stuff that your ego won't allow you to let go of, or your pride won't allow you to see, gets exposed in the light of his love. And this is why the church cannot be a, a country club built on high morality. And I'm afraid that we've made a very comfortable environment for buttoned down moralists to feel at home. But a very uncomfortable environment for the adulteress and the tax collector and the prostitute, which scares me 
because it doesn't look near as much like Jesus' band as it does the scribes and Pharisees' band. The button-down moralists in Jesus' day had a problem with Jesus. The low end of society in Jesus' day embraced Jesus. Why? Because for Jesus, doing good was not about getting to go to heaven. He was going to go back and be with his father. For Jesus, Peter would say this in the book of Acts, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So doing good was, the, was part of Jesus' work day. He woke up and said, Father, what do you want to do today? We're going to do some good. Okay, what's that look like? And I really believe Jesus navigated the world this way. What's that look like to do good? And had confrontations and had to stop and talk to the Father. What would good look like here? I know what right would look like here, but what would good look like here? Because right is just fulfilling someone's list of moral code. But good is fulfilling the heart of my Father. So what's the heart of my Father say about this person? And we need... We need a revival in the church of good over right, for sure, where we look at the people that are there and say, what would be good for this in the light of God's love versus what do people think is the right thing to do? And if we could land on that, and it's not an easy place to land, we'd look more like Jesus. But back to the point, why does Jesus do good? He's not doing good so he'll go to heaven. He's not doing good so he can escape earth. Because people matter. Because to Jesus, people mattered. They mattered so much that he wouldn't overlook them even when it was convenient or cheap to do so. We gotta send these people away. It's the end of the day. But we can't send them away hungry. And they go, well, what are we supposed to do about it? The disciples go, well, what are we supposed to do about it? There's like 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And Jesus goes, well, feed them. That's such an easy response for you. Feed them. And the disciples go, well, you ain't got that kind of food. And Jesus knows they don't have that kind of food. Of course we don't have that kind of food. He goes, well, what could we do? Well, we don't even have enough money to buy enough food for them. Because what do we have? And of course, he multiplies the little kids' fish and bread and feeds 5,000 plus women and children. Why? Because people matter. I mean, that's it. Because people matter. He wasn't building a church. In fact, they tried to get him to build a church. The next day, they all show up and try to make him king. And he preaches them all away with his communion message. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. We go, well, that does it. We don't want to follow this weirdo. And they leave Jesus and John. And they don't want anything more to do with them. But why be good to them in the first place? You're not trying to build a church. You're not trying to get more followers. You didn't take up an offering. You didn't try to build an army. What are you doing this for? Because people matter. That's it. And that was so influential on the early church that that's how they governed themselves. People matter. People matter. I've been reading, the, been trying to pay more attention to the church founders, the church fathers. I've been reading more stuff, second, third century church writers. I'll tell you something I'm blown away with. Two things from the first 300 years that I didn't ever get. One, they wrote more about patience than any virtue. In fact, they wrote about patience at the expense of almost everything else. They were big on it for, for 250 years. Patience, 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 patience. And, and you go, why are they? And it seems that from the outside looking in, it had to be that there was already a stir that we're not getting what we signed up for. And so the church pastors and fathers keep writing, patience, patience, patience. Wait in your patience, possess yourself. But what really stuns me is by the third century, the church had determined that the way to separate themselves from the clubs of the world, the religious cults, the clubs of uh, the wealthy and the elite, social clubs, whatever, was not doctrine. They weren't putting out pamphlets and writing books and promoting sermons. But they had determined that their Christianity had to be visible through loving the poor, and the stranger. That if they weren't doing that, they didn't have a right to call themselves Jesus followers. And it was the criteria for church in the first 300 years. Because they took Jesus serious when he said, they will know that you're my disciples because you love. And they all went, okay. Then they got to know that we follow Jesus because they see that we do stuff to love people. And if they don't see that we do stuff to love people, they're not going to know if we follow Jesus or not. And so the whole effort was, what can we do so that what becomes visible of us is what we do for other people. 
That's caused me to ask the question, why did they bother? Because people matter. <laughs> because people matter. And if people matter, then we take that serious. All right, as you can tell, there's no way I'm doing that for every one of these. Really what that was, was all of that. that that's to try and explain how Paul can land in this spot where he tells you, stop lying, stop stealing. Not reiterating the Ten Commandments. Paul could have, I mean, if he was just going to be a good Jew, he could have just said, thou shalt not steal. Thus saith the Lord and Moses. Don't do it. You're breaking covenant. He doesn't do that. Well, we know why he doesn't do it. They're not under the old covenant. He also doesn't identify himself as merely Jewish anymore. But he has found his Messiah who has fulfilled the law. And so for Paul, he thinks, you know, not lying, not committing adultery, not stealing is probably still a pretty good idea. But I can't preach it to you as prerequisites to receive the favor of God, not if I'm going to tell you that he's not counting your transgressions against you. This is why 30 minutes ago I said the elephant in the room here is why does all this stuff matter? It does. It really makes a difference what you do if God's a bookkeeper. Paul doesn't think God's a bookkeeper. So how do you get people to, to buy into this? You show the importance of their neighbor. Because if you don't speak the truth to your neighbor, well, you're a member of one another, and the lie really becomes a lie against your own self. And then you have to live your life to defend the lie. And then you become a hypocrite. And a hypocrite isn't just someone who says one thing and does another. A hypocrite is someone who puts on a mask and acts like they're somebody that they're really not. Because it's not the real them. It's the religious them. It's the churchy them. It's the fake them. And that's hard to maintain that guy, to keep him propped up and smiling in front of everybody when he really just wants to knock everybody out. And you go, well, that's a hypocrite because you're not what you say you are. It's not just that you're not what you say you are. It's that you're intentionally not what you say you are. The hypocrite in the Greek theater put the mask on on purpose. He doesn't accidentally play a second role because he's ashamed. He plays a second role. And so when we present the lie, I really think this is the top of the list because it's probably our biggest problem. I know it's mine. Is Paul, how honest are you being with yourself right now? So There's one thing to get up here and be honest. As honest as I can be about the scripture. As honest as I can be about my journey. Am I being honest with myself? Because if I'm not going to be honest with myself, I'm probably not going to be honest with my wife. I'm probably not going to be honest with my kids. I'm going to step away from not being honest with you. In fact, I'll, I'll be honest, wouldn't be honest with you first. I mean, that, that's just the way we are. And it's why we go back again to that, do the truth, tell the whole truth. Watch what God does when we push things out of the dark and push them into the light. And some of us are so frustrated with the way people treat us. And we're, we're frustrated because the only way they know to treat us is the real use in the dark. And so you fashion this fake you and you shove them out there in front of them. And then when the real you steps up and wants something, people are confused. And they go, well, I don't even know. You. We do this in relationships a lot. And then when the people we love get confronted by what we really want, which is the us in the dark, and they go, well, why are you mad, why are you mad at me? I didn't know what you wanted. <laughs> they go, well, the only way I could know it is that you're not presenting me with this person. And therefore, putting away falsehoods. Not just putting away lies. Put away falsehoods. Things that aren't really you. Be angry, don't sin, don't let the sun go down your anger. This is actually a quote from... The Septuagint version of Psalms, um, I didn't put up the Septuagint version of Psalms. But be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down in your wrath. Um, it sounds a little more like this in the Hebrew. This is your King James. I think it's Psalms 24.5. Um, be angry and lie in your, your bed and contemplate. Like, maybe get by yourself. Lay there and figure it out. Um, the Septuagint transfers that over to don't let the sun go down in your anger. Why? Because once you do, once you let it settle, you open the door for the devil. That rhymed, and I didn't even know it was going to. Once you settle, make room for the devil. Um, and when we're talking about the devil, we're not just talking about some ontological being, because um, I don't think Paul doesn't call him Hasatan or whatever here. It's just Diablos. It's, it's that... Uh, that thing that stands in your way. And so it, anger's, anger can be a beautiful thing um, when it's directed. You don't want someone in your life that has no ability to be angry because if they have no ability to be angry, they won't defend the things that matter. Um, even Jesus could, could get angry, but he knew where to direct his anger. 
our most striking moment is where Jesus turns the tables over in the temple. He's infuriated because people can't. I want you to think about this. I didn't mean to get into this, but I got to. You couldn't take a Roman coin into the temple in the first century because it had an image of Caesar on it, which was idolatry. Now, you had to use those in the market, but you couldn't take it into the temple. So when you got to the temple, you had to stop the money changers table and you had to churn in your Roman money or your coin from the imp- wherever. You had to change that for temple coin. The temple pressed their own money. The exchange rate was set by the priest, the high priest. It wasn't set by Rome. It wasn't set by tax collectors. It was set by the priest. So the richest person in Israel, we always act like the richest person in Israel was tax collectors. Richest person in Israel was a high priest because he ran the money exchange table and he set the exchange rate. Jesus comes into the temple and he's infuriated because he sees people can't afford to buy the pigeon and the turtle dove to offer a sacrifice. They come all the way to Jerusalem for the feast. It's Passover week. They come all the way to the Jerusalem for the feast. They can't afford. They're given their Roman coin. They're getting nothing back. And Jesus watches this and runs over to that table and slings it in the air. And that could have got him killed right there. In fact, he's, he's dead in five days, six days after that moment. You, want, you ever really want to wonder what really ticked him off? Mess with people's money. That's what really ticks him off. And when Jesus did that, man, he was downhill from there. But his whole point, before he did it, he cursed a fig tree in a valley. He went, you didn't give any figs, you're cursed. And the whole point is that that which you're supposed to do, you're not doing, and therefore it is removed. And so, listen, anger can be a great emotion. It needs steered, it needs directed. Um, I don't claim to know when to turn over tables. I'll just watch Jesus turn over tables. I also want to point out that Jesus never steered his anger and his violence at people. So he didn't go in there with a whip and beat up the high priest. Go, let me show you some Kung Fu and, and take people out. And so anger, anger directed is important. Um, I'm not going to work them all. All right. I, 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 I will say, um, watch what you say because your words need to give grace to people who hear it. This is, this is one that I got to get reminded of the Holy Spirit all the time. You don't know who's listening. So think about what you say because your words, you, you can be an instrument of grace or you can be an instrument of judgment. You can turn people off or you can turn people on and it's up to you and it's your call. And so if you just want to say whatever you want to say, anytime you want to say it, you can do that. But you might not minister grace to the people that need it the most. So check it. Check it at the door of your heart. Ask the Holy Spirit for help. Why? Because people matter. That's it. They, they matter as much as you do. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. I think, I think in context, watch what you say. Don't grieve the Spirit. Put away bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander together with malice. A lot of the first one is what you say, and a lot of the last one is what you say, how you say it. And in the middle is don't grieve the Holy Spirit. I personally think Paul is saying that the way to grieve the Holy Spirit is to not speak grace to people. Because he never really describes what it would look like to grieve the Holy Spirit, but he sandwiches it in there with not dealing with your own emotions and letting your mouth just say whatever it wants. And then in the middle is don't grieve the Spirit. Because I think, because the Holy Spirit is not about pointing out what's wrong with everyone. Because he's a witness to what Christ has done. Be kind, be tenderhearted, forgive one another. As God in Christ has forgiven you. I love this verse because it really tells you the basis for forgiveness. Forgive other people the way God forgave you. How did he forgive you? In Christ. He didn't forgive you because you earned it. He didn't forgive you because you deserved it. Oh, by the way, he didn't even forgive you because you asked for it. He forgave you because of Jesus. So don't wait on people to earn your forgiveness. Here's a freebie. If people have to earn your forgiveness, you're a legalist. Because you're demanding that people meet a certain standard by which you give your grace. If, you, if your God did that to you, he's a legalist. If he said to you, oh, I'll do this for you, but you got to jump that high. That's my standard. That's not grace. That's a standard. So if I can't forgive you until you meet my criteria, I didn't say you got to forget. I didn't say the pain goes away. I didn't say you got to trust everybody. But we forgive because we are forgiven and we're not forgiven because we're good. We're forgiven because God is so good and Christ is so good. Therefore, just imitate God. How? As if you were his beloved children, because you are, 
Live in love in the way Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Wrote this down at the end. To live in love is to live in sacrifice. Do not imitate God outside of love. I, I'm amazed at how much foolishness we allow ourselves to get by with as Christians. And when we're confronted, we've got a verse that God did that. Violence, killing, bloodshed, anger. We got ourselves a verse. And that justifies everything because we got a verse. Paul says, imitate God, live in love. Which God do I imitate? Look, make it look like Jesus. That's the God you're imitating. The God expressed in Christ. Don't you go back here and pull you some random Torah verse that you pulled out of Leviticus because it justifies genocide and slavery and misogyny and whatever thing else you want. And go, well, God did that back there. If you can't find it in Jesus, you don't get to find it in God because that's somebody writing about God before Jesus comes along and says, I'm what daddy always looked like. Everything else is a false picture of the Father. So when we imitate God, we're actually imitating what we see of God in Christ. All right, I'm going to stop. I feel like I went a long time at the top of that, and then the back side of that just kind of got crammed into everything up front. So I hope you know my heart there is to really, really try to show you that the reason Paul lands on this is because people matter, not because he's trying to give you the keys to favor or help you get to heaven. He might be helping you put a little heaven into your earth. That's for sure. And if you want to see what hell's like, here's a tip. If you want to see what hell's like, you don't have to wait till you die. Just do everything opposite of this. I mean, really, just lie to everybody. Go nuts when you get angry. Do whatever you want. Steal everybody else's stuff. Don't help anybody that's needy. Let evil come out of your mouth constantly. Don't build people up, just tear them down. Never give grace, give people works, performance, condemnation, and guilt. Grieve the Holy Spirit all day long by just saying whatever you want. Um, don't put away bitterness. Be as bitter, as wrathful, as angry, get in arguments and slander. Um, hold it deeply against people. That's deep-seated anger. Uh, be as mean as you can be. Have a cold, hard heart. Only forgive people that earn it. And uh, forget about imitating the God that looks like Jesus. Imitate the, whatever God you can find in the Old Testament. Do all that. You'll have yourself plenty of hell. And you'll believe in hell fast if you don't already. And man, that baby will burn for a long time. That stuff right there. So why not? Because people matter. You as well. Father, thank you. What a night. Thank you for this word. Thank you for, yet again, speaking something real and relevant in our lives and showing us that we are loved and showing us that we are forgiven and showing us that what we are to do with that is to spread that to your offspring because people matter because they're yours they belong to you and I, I want them to wake up to that and I'm as I get older I'm figuring out there's a bunch of stuff I don't know and I'm I'm not really cool with it but I'm accepting it but what I do know what I do believe is that you love me and that you love all of your children and that we've been robbed for too long of knowing what that looks like. And Father, if I truly believe that, I ought to live like it because your people matter. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> amen.